Dr. Eric Gontier came to Egypt with us for the first time in 2007. A geologist and ethnomineralogist at the Musée de Loma Paris, his mission is to identify the rocks used by ancient Egyptians. That's where it all started for him. Together, we visited some of the most beautiful archaeological sites in the world, where we discovered construction particularities that the generally accepted hypotheses can't explain. In March 2016, he agreed to accompany us again when we filmed Builders of the Ancient Mysteries. This time, he requested more precise measuring equipment, exactly what was needed to quantify our observations. If we think about history, concerning certain periods, and the hypotheses generally admitted, none of them explain the precision we measured. That's what you will see in this documentary. This is how and why we proceeded, aiming to verify what our intuition suggested. We are an independent research team whose members come from varied backgrounds, scientists, engineers, technicians, architects, stonemasons, and passionate researchers. If our approach confuses or bothers certain historians, that's to be expected because our procedure is different. We chose to somewhat distance ourselves from the models imposed by history because we noticed that its memory is not always reliable and worse, that it can influence our outlook. Let's take the Great Pyramid as an example. Our perception will be different based on what we think we see, instead of things that are presented like this. Or something like this. It's all a matter of perspective. Let's start with what history tells us about our species. Based on recent discoveries, the first Homo sapiens appeared 300,000 years ago. They lived as hunters and gatherers in small nomadic tribes for 290,000 years, before first settling down and taking up in Sumer, ancient Iraq, approximately six to 7,000 years ago at the beginning of civilization. In this chronology, Egyptians started building pyramids about 3,500 years later, and there is obviously no room left in these dates for an ancient advanced civilization that would have been the origin of ours. Well, the first thing that becomes apparent to the unbiased observer is that there is a huge contrast between certain gigantic monuments and the methods supposedly used to build them. Since these sites date back to times when we only had primitive technology, it is therefore possible to achieve them with primitive technology. On peut effectivement le faire, ça c'est clair, puisque tout, tout est dit, tout est là. Je veux dire, il suffit simplement de regarder. That's the general approach that archaeology uses on this topic, which seems normal when we consider the process of technological advances that mark our history, from the invention of the wheel thousands of years ago to nanotechnologies. But as the late Jean-Louis Boistel, an experienced stonemason, said, Quelle est notre objectivité par rapport aux sociétés humaines telles que le Moyen Âge, où on a, bon, je précise, pour le Moyen Âge, on n'a que 35% des archives qui sont traduites. Qu'est-ce qu'il y a dans les autres Et on tire des conclusions sur un embryon 
de connaissance. The Middle Ages are yesterday compared to ancient Egypt. This approach is problematic. It influences our view and keeps us from thinking freely. The builders left us no explanation of their methods. We are not certain of the dating of the structures, and we still don't know how they were built. The generally admitted hypothesis is that these monuments were achieved by the use of primitive technologies and a very large workforce over a very long time span. Influenced by this model of progress pushed by history, why immediately discard all other hypotheses by declaring them impossible? For example, the use of machine tools in ancient Egypt is seen as absurd, because everyone knows that Egyptians didn't have machine tools. To go further, how do we know that? Because history says so. Based on what? On the fact that we have not found machines, pieces, representations, or even texts mentioning machines. We could answer that there is no record of the building of these ancient sites, but yet they still exist. We could also ask what such tools would have had to be made of to last thousands of years. Est-ce que les machines ont, ont été fondues pour faire des armes parce qu'on a plus pensé à se taper dessus que à, à la connaissance en général? C'est une piste. We could then observe that we have found objects and representations of strange objects that were either misunderstood or considered ritual or religious items because of their strangeness. As for the texts, we think many are not studied the right way. And that story, as a matter of fact, is told in full detail in the Edfu building text. But all this does not prove anything, however you look at it, because the absence of proof is not the proof of absence. Are we really sure that we've made a breakthrough in terms of how we understand ancient ways of thinking? Instead of speculating, we've decided to look into what we have in front of us, the monuments. We have decided to study them with the best instruments at our disposal to make them talk. Because in the beginning, on paper, it all seemed unlikely. L'île de Pâques, relier ça avec euh, Gizeh, relier ça avec, euh, avec Tambo, avec euh, d'autres sites archéologiques dans le monde, ça me paraissait mais complètement farfelu. Because our history orients our view when it forbids this type of associating different sites from different areas that argues for a common origin. But any link between these two sites is deemed totally impossible because of their historical, political, and religious context, which is precisely what some people criticize us for neglecting. More precisely, we are criticized for not accepting what history says about them. History says the Temple of the Valley was built approximately 2,500 years before Christ, and Machu Picchu approximately 1,400 CE. Of course, if 4,000 years separates these two sites, one single source of this technology seems strictly impossible. So where do these dates come from? The ones we are most interested in come from elements found nearby or inscriptions. Since it's almost impossible to date the carving of a stone, we date bones or other organic matter or known objects found on the sites. Humans have the unfortunate habit of always rebuilding on the same site. This complicates research, since it is impossible to dig deeper without damaging the sites. What percentage of the actual total amount of existing objects is represented by those we have found? We don't know. So what is left? Once again, what we have found. At Machu Picchu, we can clearly distinguish two styles. This one... and this one. A fact that some people explain this way. Il faut pas confondre eh, la fonction de certaines structures, de certains espaces, comme par exemple les temples et les palais, et à différence ces structures plus fonctionnelles, comme par exemple une maison. Archaeology says that this site would have been active for only a century. Very damaged in some areas, it would have endured earthquakes that would have destroyed or damaged blocks of the sacred structures that were nevertheless not restored identically. How can that be explained? Let's dare to ask, what if this part of Machu Picchu is much older than the rest of the constructions dating back to the 15th century? How can we know that? Thanks to new technologies and non-destructive methods that are increasingly powerful and reveal what is still buried under sites, because as we've shown in the previous films, this same difference of styles is observed elsewhere on the planet. We can observe this same phenomena of the use of different technologies in numerous ancient sites. Archaeology explains it by the fact that such differences are inherent in Homo sapiens. Everywhere there have been people, they did the same things. 
That includes the use of stone blocks weighing several dozens of tons and the strange handbags represented in Gobekli Tepe, Sumer, and in Peru. These populations would have started with the most complicated and durable method, assembling complexly shaped stone blocks with no cement held together by nothing but the precision which with they were cut. Then this technology was slowly lost, and people ended up building in easier and less durable ways. Egypt as a whole seems to go against the idea of linear progress. Remember the words of the American engineer Chris Dunn. And then you follow the progress of that civilization over 3,000 years, and it ends up they're still using the same tools that they started with. That doesn't make sense. That paradox is hard to explain. C'était courant chez eux de soulever beaucoup des poids énormes, et je dirais c'était courant sur le monde entier à cette même époque d'avoir des pierres gigantesques. La seule chose qui me surprend aujourd'hui, c'est plutôt qu'est-ce qui s'est passé pour que nous ayons perdu cette masse de connaissances. Good question. Either humans at different times in history always end up losing their knowledge, or the same cause has produced the same effects everywhere, but we can't see that because of the dating. Another way of dating these sites is done by the inscriptions found when they are available. For example, the Serapeum of Saqqara goes back to the 18th Egyptian dynasty around 1500 BCE. Its 22 granite tanks contain the mummies of sacred bulls. This tank is the only one with hieroglyphic carvings on the outside. But when you look closer, the work is very imprecise and poorly done. It's hard to conceive that the same people who crafted these tanks with such care could be satisfied with such flimsy engravings. However, these engravings have determined the dating and the function of these tanks. L'intérieur is découpé uh, parfaitement droit, with des angles quasi parfaits. Et ça, autant dans le sol que les murs de la cuve. C'est une prouesse, une prouesse absolument incroyable. Let's take a second example of dating by inscriptions. The caves of Barabar and Nagarjuni in India, where even more than in the Serapeum, the level of precision is astounding. Once again, we know of no archive or text that describes how this was achieved. It is on the basis of this simple, unskillful inscription that the grandson of King Ashoka is credited for carving these caves. It is said that for political reasons he gifted this place to the members of a sect so that they could have shelter from the monsoon rains. This inscription alone defined the whole historical context, both political and religious, for these mind-boggling caves. It's why they've been classified as shelters created with primitive tools. On croit que ça a été fait avec un au laser. Enfin, on, ça n'a pas été fait au laser. Ça s'est fait à la main. At this point, everyone knows it couldn't be any other way. The context determines the tools and techniques, period. That may be the reason these caves have not been really studied and are mostly unknown in the Western world. In this particular case, we can wonder about the validity of dating based on inscriptions, since in one of the caves there are inscriptions from a more recent period. This one goes back to the 5th or 6th century after Christ. This too dates to the same approximate years, which shows that throughout time, people have had no hesitation about writing on the walls, which is probably the case with the first inscription. These caves are unique because they were chiseled out of a rock as hard as granite. History tells us that these workers were capable of succeeding on their first attempt. These five rectangular chambers were cut with extreme precision. They are totally symmetrical with walls as smooth as glass. And the day after this was achieved, no one was ever capable of doing it again. Everything produced in the following centuries, as spectacular as it may be, never equaled the unique precision of these caves. But we had to scan them in 3D to grasp this precision that contradicts the vague idea we have of how they were made. In order for the idea of scanning them to even occur to you, you must first think that our history may be different than what we believe, which is a step we take easily. As the Serapeum and Barabar show us, history doesn't just influence our judgment, it also has a short memory. But in its defense, that's normal. Knowledge has such a strong power that it is a target of choice for conquerors throughout history.
In that respect, as revealed by the author Selby and Steinmetz, the Persians burned Egyptian temples and writings in 527 BCE, and 40 years later in 490 BCE, they burned many Greek writings. Wars led to more wars and the need for revenge. In Persepolis, in what is now Iran, in 330 BCE, the Greeks, led by Alexander the Great, destroyed 12,000 written volumes produced by the Magi. One century later, in 214 BCE, the Emperor Qin Shi Huang, who inherited one of China's seven kingdoms, subdued the other six and ordered the destruction of all their books, including some by Confucius. In 146 BCE, the Romans come onto the stage and destroyed 500,000 Phoenician parchments in Carthage. Then in 52 BCE, Julius Caesar ordered the destruction of all the books of the Druid College. A little later, towards 250 CE, the Great Library of Pergamon is said to have been destroyed by Christian fundamentalists. But it should be known that Mark Antony is said to have already gifted to Cleopatra in 41 BCE 200,000 books from that library. In 270 CE, the famous Library of Alexandria holding 400,000 to 700,000 books, depending on sources, was burned by the Romans. And to wrap up this dark period for the memory of knowledge in 391, Theophilus destroyed what was left of the Library of Alexandria, said to have still contained 42,000 books at the time. These events covering only a short historical period allow us to understand why we have so little information on antiquity. If the Antikythera mechanism had not been miraculously discovered in an ancient shipwreck in the early 20th century, no one would have ever known it existed. It took many centuries before something similar was created again. Il y a des engrenages à l'intérieur qui sont d'une technicité, d'une ingéniosité qui est, qui est juste extraordinaire parce qu'il y a des façons de faire, de résoudre des problèmes où notre civilisation est la passée à côté. Not only had history forgotten its existence, it categorized texts describing it by Greek authors as fiction. Quand vous lisez ce texte, vous avez l'impression de lire une description de la machine d'anticitaire. And this was only 2,000 years ago. Bon, ben écoutez les gars, il faut vous réveiller. Euh, ce qu'on nous dit euh, sur la mécanique, c'est peut-être pas tout à fait correct. Et il faut peut-être corriger deux, trois choses. But if it reminds us that history is quick to forget, it also shows us that objects don't last. C'est parce qu'il a coulé qu'il a été sauvé. C'est un paradoxe. Il serait resté sur la terre, il aurait été fondu, recyclé pour faire autre chose. C'était la loi pour tous les objets métalliques qui ne servaient pas à partir d'un certain moment. Il y a un tas de choses qu'aujourd'hui on ne ferait plus qui sont dans la machine d'anticiteur. Ce n'est pas seulement un mécanisme avec des engrenages, il y a toute une philosophie qui sort de ces engrenages pour dire voilà comment on voit le temps, comment on le calcule, mais comment on respecte les gens qui ont amené toutes ces connaissances. Beyond its achievement, it's the conceptualization that precedes it that makes engineers like Mathias Boutet marvel. Puis en fait, c'était l'évidence, c'était possible, ça existait, c'était devant moi. What makes the mechanism extraordinary and even more incomprehensible is the fact that we could forget the existence of this object. As far as forgetting goes, it can get even worse. History forgot the beginning of sedentary life, like parents forgetting the first steps of their own children. This crucial moment marks the beginning of our civilization, when some of our hunter-gatherer ancestors decided to settle down and become farmers, which for a while our history situated seven to 8,000 years ago in Sumer. The site of Gobekli Tepe, buried close to 12,000 years ago, teaches us a lesson because of its very existence and a technological level that is totally anachronic. Avant Gobekli Tepe, on parlait de Sumer, Our, et on affirmait évidemment que c'était les plus anciennes, les premières tours de Jericho, la première tour, etc. Quand on a découvert Gobekli Tepe, un site perdu quelque part en Turquie remet en cause toute la chronologie. On ne remet pas en cause les datations apportées sur ces différentes, euh, différents sites Sumer et autres. Mais euh, du coup, on est obligé de repartir sur de nouvelles bases et de reconsidérer l'histoire euh, pour ce qu'elle est. Ça, c'est une des grandes révolutions, mais qui nous dit qu'il n'y en aura pas d'autres derrière A discovery that could make us consider more seriously this hypothesis of an ancient civilization that disappeared in a cataclysm at the end of the Younger Dryas period, approximately 13,000 years ago, as seen in our previous films. Ils se sont rendus compte que des civilisations ou euh, des groupements humains avait euh, apparaissait à un moment donné et disparaissait subitement sans qu'on sache euh, ce qu'ils étaient devenus. Au point même que euh, beaucoup de croyances euh, empêchaient de, de travailler sur, sur ces périodes 
parce que c'était incompréhensible et souvent d'ailleurs le, le, un des problèmes c'était que il y avait un mouvement centripète sur l'Europe, la France notamment, où, où est née la préhistoire et, et donc on se disait tout doit partir de là. Et on a essayé de répercuter ces connaissances européennes sur l'Afrique, sur l'Asie et ailleurs. But since about 30 years ago, researchers have noticed that something was not right. Certains chercheurs sont revenus sur le tardiglaciaire, donc qui correspond au Drias récent, et c'est là qu'on s'est rendu compte qu'il y avait effectivement euh, la culture de Clovis avait disparu suite à un événement euh, dramatique euh, qui était cette chute euh, de météorites. Du coup, l'idée a conforté celle que beaucoup de gens réfutaient, à savoir qu'il pouvait y avoir des connaissances euh, euh, qui avaient disparu au même moment et que certaines de ces connaissances avaient peut-être laissé des traces et que finalement euh, ces populations ont développé les apports qui leur avaient été donnés pour en arriver à des civilisations hautement évoluées du style euh, égypte ancienne. Visiting all these major sites of our past, we were shocked by the flowing lines, the purity and precision of the achievements that always give us the impression of an easily and well-mastered craft making us believe these builders could achieve whatever they wanted, no matter what the challenge. On ne peut pas arriver à un travail de haut niveau quand on est mal dans sa peau. Donc les gens qui faisaient ces travaux-là étaient des gens qui étaient... Euh, qui travaillaient dans de bonnes conditions, dans de très bonnes, dans de très bonnes conditions. Et quand on regarde certains cailloux, euh, dans d'excellentes conditions. Ah oui, vraiment. This defies the logic that often claims that ancient people were irrational based on their beliefs. As soon as we don't understand something, we think it's because it's spiritual or religious, which keeps us from properly understanding these constructions. Over the years, we've gotten used to recognizing the strange details on the sites. It seemed perfectly normal to follow our intuition and do something no one else had ever done before, to run the raffometer on the blocks of Pumapunku. Nous, aujourd'hui, en tant qu'archéologue, on ne fonctionne pas comme les historiens. This moment we are about to unveil contains the essence of our approach, the way we look at what our eyes give us to see. We reach the plateau of Tiwanaku in Bolivia at an altitude of 4000 meters. Ça je voudrais voir. Quand le tournage s'est déroulé à Pumapunku, en me baladant à l'intérieur du, du site, j'ai eu le loisir de pouvoir observer les différents blocs et degrés et dans des sites. Oh, c'est pas possible. Le travail. Et dans ma tête, c'était plus grand que ça, tu vois, mais ça reste quand même colossal. Moi, je suis persuadé que tout ce qu'on voit ici a été poli pratiquement avec du grès. Eric always tries to explain the work with ancient stone cutting techniques that are the simplest. After observing on his first round, la surface peut être préparée grès contre grès hein, ou contre d'autres matériaux. C'est du temps de travail énorme, mais le résultat, il est, il est au top. Il est au top. Ça, on peut l'obtenir avec des petits éclats de, de roches assez plats, un peu d'abrasif. Et après, c'est une question de temps, c'est-à-dire qu'il va falloir entrer, sortir, rentrer, sortir, tu vois, aller et venir comme ça, croiser aussi dans ce sens. C'est un travail monstrueux. That's the classic scraping technique. But this time, we didn't just rely on visual observation. Eric requested that we come with a roughometer. Voilà, le bras recule tout doucement avec ce, ce bras qui est ici. C'est lui qui va nous dessiner le transect, c'est-à-dire suivre une ligne droite, tous les reliefs qui, qui existent sur une roche. This is necessary to quantify the precision. Je vais essayer de trouver la surface la plus intéressante. Alors, c'est formidable parce qu'on voit des pics assez importants par endroit. Oh la vache, 185 microns, mais c'est que dalle C'est que dalle C'est la différence entre le bas et le haut. Et le haut. Voilà. On est à 185 microns. Est-ce que tu imagines C'est rien. Microns. C'est-à-dire qu'on a une qualité de, de surface de polissage qui est faite à la main, qui est absolument mais prodigieuse. Absolument prodigieuse. À la main, t'es sûr Moi, je dirais que c'est fait à la main. C'est fait avec des instruments, mais ça a été... Euh, les instruments ont été manipulés à la main. Ça, pour moi, c'est sûr, sûr et certain. At this moment, again, Eric, like many archaeologists, seems self-confident. Wow, 76, 516. Oh, la vache 
On était le plus petit était à 85 dans le, sur un grès rouge. Alors que là, on est sur andésite. Ah, il faut que je marque andésite aussi. Andésite. Mais sur le grès, c'est plus facile. Oh là, regarde. Magnifique. That's when we reach the tipping point. The machine reveals a very particular surface. 31 653. Au oh, flash le celui-là. 31 653. Et quand on a commencé à poser le rugosimètre, la pointe de diamant glissait sur le, la surface et a commencé à nous donner des chiffres auxquels on s'attendait absolument pas. Absorbed by his measurements, he doesn't immediately realize the implications. Non, ce que je veux simplement démontrer aussi, c'est que l'homme est intelligent. Il est capable de réaliser des prouesses absolument colossales. If it is possible to achieve using abrasive techniques, it gets harder on the internal sides of the block, where they are just as smooth as the external sides and with very precise angles. Pour arriver à, à travailler les, les faces extérieures, ça c'est très facile. On a des systèmes de découpe, ça peut être avec des scies, avec des fils, avec, on, on peut tout imaginer. Euh, voilà, on n'a pas les preuves, mais euh, tout est euh, imaginable. En revanche, plus on s'enfonce à l'intérieur des reliefs, là, plus ça devient compliqué. Et ce qui est le, entre autres le plus compliqué, c'est d'arriver, euh, toujours pareil, dans le fond des angles euh, en, qui sont en négatif. Et ensuite, de descendre encore plus profond à l'intérieur du matériau qui lui-même est encore redescendu en relief et une fois, deux fois, trois fois. Et ce procédé euh, va demander à la création ou l'imagination d'un de, 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 outillage qui permettrait de descendre à l'intérieur. Et puis quand on descend encore plus loin, idem, il va falloir changer de matériel, toujours pour garder les parties, euh, les côtés parfaitement droits, les arêtes vives et les angles à 90 degrés. While shooting in Pumapunku, someone on our team made another discovery. The age blocks are exactly one meter high. Two German archaeologists noted the same fact back in 1892, but it went completely unnoticed. With the help of a rangefinder using a laser to measure, Eric measured different parts of the blocks. Mais j'avais meilleure mesure tout à l'heure. J'avais 999, là j'ai 0,994. Moi ce que je peux dire pour l'instant, je suis surpris, mais je voudrais bien avoir une deuxième mesure pour confirmer. We are going to measure another block that is in perfect condition, but somewhat inaccessible. <laughs> un mètre pile. Un mètre pile. Eric is somewhat embarrassed. He cannot explain it. He hesitates, searches for words, then suddenly says. Moi, je ne fais pas un calcul mathématique, j'observe simplement les moyennes de ces mesures. Elles sont extrêmement proches. C'est à croire qu'on a travaillé ici avec un outillage mécanique. Or, euh, il semblerait que, a priori, on pourrait dire que ça a été fait à la main, mais le, la précision est telle que ça nous pose de sérieux problèmes. On est dans un système décimal ultra précis. Ça veut dire qu'on n'est pas dans de l'aléatoire. Des... On peut presque dire que les blocs ont été même préfabriqués. C'est-à-dire qu'on a imposé un, un modèle et que tous les blocs ont été alignés sur ce modèle. Ils ont euh, atteint un, un degré de polissage plan qui est euh, hors norme. Aujourd'hui, on obtiendrait ça uniquement avec euh, une mécanique assez puissante à base de, de, de laser et de comment dire d'appareils mécaniques rotatifs de très très haute précision. The problem is not only achieving such flat surfaces even in the angles, but that the dimensions are identical from one block to another. Et ce sont des mesures extrêmement précises. Et on se dit que ajouter à la difficulté de pouvoir obtenir des formes simples, apparemment simples eh bien, s'ajoute aussi la nécessité d'obtenir à plusieurs reprises sur les mêmes blocs des mesures de 1 mètre. Donc ça complique encore le système de fabrication. We have no hypotheses on how these blocks were made, only vague ideas resulting from visual observations like Eric made on the first day. With the rafometer and the rangefinder, even while he admits that it's an enormous job, Eric mentions copper tools and abrasive stone. Tu reprends, etc. But after measuring all the sizes and surfaces, his outlook is totally different. These measurements showed us something we hadn't noticed. A standardized production of complex shapes, carved in andesite, a rock that is as hard as tempered steel, and with a surface as flat as modern concrete. Given these results, these must have been done with something more than the copper and abrasive tools. He hesitates to talk about it. Questioning the current standard hypotheses is a hard pill to swallow. 
pour être honnête, au départ, j ai, j ai, je me suis dit non, on ne peut pas parler de ça. Ça engendre trop de, de choses bizarres, trop, trop particulières. Et on va m'attaquer euh, en me disant, bah oui, mais c'est un parti pris, euh, tu as choisi les meilleurs côtés, tu as choisi le bloc, tu as choisi, etc. Il y a une manipulation derrière, et ce qui n'est pas du tout le cas. Ce système métrique, à supposer qu'il s'appelle le maître hein, à l'époque, peu importe, pourquoi We are going to talk about the metric system again. But before that, why are we the first to be so closely interested in the details of these blocks? Probably because history makes this useless. We don't know how these blocks were made, but we are certain it was with primitive tools. That's a constant that makes this situation almost grotesque. How could we formulate a hypothesis on the way the rocks were cut based on partial information? These details are so important that once known, they are precisely what makes Eric change his mind and not the other way around. To measure is one thing, but to be able to explain how this was achieved is another. To better understand the difficulties of carving rocks, you must know their level of hardness. Alors, un certain Monsieur Moss a créé une échelle relative de dureté chez les minéraux. Cette échelle relative va de 1, le talc, jusqu'à 10, le diamant. Ici, j'ai un diamant noir. La dureté est mesurée simplement par l'effet de rayure d'un corps sur un autre. A harder rock can scratch a softer one, but it doesn't work the other way around. If you take granite or andesite, which are at hardness level 7, copper is at 3 and can't scratch or pierce them. Il y a une grande affirmation archéologique qui est que les Égyptiens n'avaient pas les métaux qu'il fallait pour, pour tailler. Moi, je dirais qu'ils n'en avaient pas parce que nous n'en avons pas trouvé. Alors, dans l'Antiquité, moi, je témoigne avec tous mes collègues tailleurs de pierre avec qui nous avons discuté, surtout ceux qui connaissent bien l'Égypte et qui ont travaillé là-bas, qui font de l'archéologie égyptienne. Euh, non, les granites égyptiens n'ont pas pu être taillés avec des cailloux ou avec des outils en cuivre. Il fallait, au moins pour euh, la plupart des sculptures et des statues qui sont hyper finies, euh, il fallait des outils en métal. Alors, quel type d'alliage, quel type de, de pureté, quel type de trempe euh, Que sont devenus ces outils Regardez les outils médiévaux, on en trouve très peu, ils sont rares, très rares. Et les outils de taille de pierre du 19e et 18e, ils sont encore très rares. Alors dans l'Antiquité, où le métal coûtait cher, très cher, il n'y en avait pas beaucoup, le peu qu'il y avait, il ne pouvait pas traîner. Hein. The andesite of Pumapunku is between 6.5 and 7 on the hardness scale, almost the same level as the tempered steel that is necessary to carve it. Otherwise, you must abrade it. And that is exactly the problem Eric is looking at, faced with the repetition of the same dimensions from one block to another. Contrary to what some people say, we never oppose the idea that it is possible to cut hard rocks with a copper blade and abrasive. Si les blocs sont légèrement arrondis ou cintrés, si on, est, on essaie de rectifier avec une lame de scie à, à travers, qu'est-ce qui va se passer La lame de scie va se cintrer elle aussi. Et en se cintrant, elle va casser son axe ou elle va se déchirer à l'intérieur et on ne pourra même plus la sortir. Donc ça, c'est même pas envisageable. The question is not whether or not cutting hard rock is possible, but rather whether or not it's possible to cut all sides of a several ton block with such precision. L'archéologie n'a révélé la présence que de cuivre, hein, de marteau, d'un outillage assez rudimentaire. On a retrouvé beaucoup de percuteurs en pierre. En revanche, sur les sites des carrières, mais on se demande quand même si, si c'est raisonnable de penser que de telles œuvres les statues monumentales avec une précision comme celle que l'on a déjà décrite, ces ajustages bloc par bloc, ces figures polygonales qui apparaissent sur les murs, est-ce que ça peut être réalisé avec de simples percuteurs en pierre Moi j'ai du mal. Maintenant de là à attaquer du granit, des amphibolites, du basalte, je ne dis pas que ce soit impossible puisque les, les choses sont là, mais je, je, mais je m'étonne. Quand vous avez des pierres de 10 tonnes à assembler, ou de 5 tonnes à assembler, il ne faut pas s'imaginer que vous allez les, les enlever pour les retailler, les remettre en place, ou les pousser, comme on a pu le dire abondamment il y a, pas, il y a, long, il y a quelques temps. Non, il faut être sérieux. Amusez-vous à faire ça avec une pierre de 100 kg, vous allez voir déjà ce que ça donne. Il y a toujours le recours aux percuteurs en pierre, 
Mais quand on regarde certaines surfaces, on ne voit pas les coups de percussion, ni de bouchardage, ni de piquetage. C'est assez surprenant, surtout dans des endroits où que plus personne ne verra puisque les deux blocs sont appliqués l'un contre l'autre. Alors quelles sont là où les techniques employées Pour l'instant, on n'a aucune réponse là-dessus. Aucune réponse là-dessus. There is a big gap between observation and the rare hypotheses that were never actually put to the test. Alors il y a eu des expériences qui ont été faites par des archéologues, on les voit tailler avec des cailloux. On les voit prendre un morceau de granit et puis ou une pierre un peu plus dure et puis tailler. Bon. Oui, on peut toujours faire des éclats. On voit sur ce document un archéologue qui fait un œil. Très bien, c'est un œil, mais c'est un œil grossier, c'est un œil, je dirais, préhistorique. À côté, il y a des statues en granit à Soin, où on voit des yeux qui ont des paupières de 2 mm, qui ont une finesse et qui se perdent dans la pierre avec une très, très grande finesse dans l'arête. Vous ne faites pas ça avec une pierre. Vous ne pouvez le faire qu'avec un outil. But since history says so, it must have been done with primitive tools, like these. Or more precisely... Pour le cyclopéen, c'est beaucoup plus dur, parce qu'il faut être hyper, hyper rigoureux. Alors, ça nécessite un appareillage tracé. Il est impossible et impensable qu'il ne l'ait pas fait sans, sans épure. C'est pas possible. As Jean-Louis Boistel noted, to build, you need a blueprint. That is even more true with the Great Pyramid, given its size. Even if Egyptology claimed for a long time that it was not. Here, like in Pumapunku, if your eyes are not trained to see the precision, if you follow the reconstitution of workers at the times the pyramids were built, you can easily confirm the idea that with thousands of dedicated workers, it could be achieved in 20 to 25 years. To just pile up the rocks on top of each other with no guarantee they will hold in place, that doesn't work for the building of the Great Pyramid. Remember, this article from a previous film said that it would take 80 trucks a day, five days a week, over 12 years, just to fill up a quarry with the volume of stone comparable to the Great Pyramid. Une chose qui est, qui est fortement dérangeante pour moi et peut-être même pour d'autres, c'est de, de penser que euh, l'ancienne Égypte démarre euh, brusquement. Et c'est quelque chose d'acquis, tout est déjà su. Et il n'y avait qu'à se mettre au travail, et puis on construit des pyramides, on construit des temples colossaux. Euh, voilà, c'est normal, c'est normal. Dans toute l'ancienne Égypte, apparemment, ne sont que des innovations, à tout point de vue. Tout, tout était compris dès le départ. C'est quand même bizarre ça, c'est quand même curieux, ça laisse, euh, laisse un peu pantois quand on y réfléchit. Ça laisse peut-être aussi entendre qu'il y a eu... Euh, avant eux, des groupements humains, bon, d'accord, mais qu'il y a peut-être eu aussi des connaissances autres, peut-être plus évoluées encore que l'Égypte, mais qui ont disparu. Pour l'Egyptologie, la Great Pyramid est either la tombe de King Khufu ou son cénotaphe, built en 25 ans durant la 4e dynastie, même si personne ne semble pas d'accord sur quand son règne a commencé ou how long it lasted. Tomb or cenotaph, it's a little confusing, so let's specify that a tomb contains a body, where a cenotaph is a sort of monument to the dead without a body. This hesitation comes from the fact that no actual body was ever found in the Great Pyramid, nor in any pyramid of the first dynasties, which some Egyptologists explain by looting, whereas for others these are only symbolic monuments. Remember this old controversy reported by Pliny the Elder mentioned in the previous films, the 12 authors who disagreed on the function of these pyramids. History only remembers the writings of the Greek Herodotus, once considered the father of history, who first said 2,000 years after the supposed date of its building, the Great Pyramid was the tomb of Khufu. Today, Egyptology is distancing itself from this theory, but unfortunately, none of the other 11 writings remain. This is another reminder that history is based on sources, and in this case, they're no longer in existence. The result is a biased view based on the thinking of these ancient authors, an assumption that it was always thought that the Great Pyramid was a tomb, but that is now questioned by various researchers. Based on older compiled writings, the historian Abu Salimun al-Kabi reports that in the past, scientists posited four possible functions for the pyramids of Giza, astronomical observation, tombs, storage of goods and knowledge, or disaster shelters. He explains that Muslim scholars only consider two functions, astronomical observation and depositories of knowledge. The scholar Al-Sayyudi attributes them to a very remote past, arguing if they were built in our times, the knowledge necessary for its construction would still be known to man. 
For classic Muslim historians in general, the origins of Egyptian civilization go back much further in time than what Western historians claim. If we do not have Egyptian writings explaining the use of the pyramids and Herodotus' claims are wrong, on what basis can we conclude that the Great Pyramid was Khufu's tomb? That hypothesis is getting harder to maintain. First, the name Khufu is written inside the Great Pyramid on the blocks inside a closed space above the Pharaoh's chamber. The inscriptions are poorly inscribed with red ink, and we have not yet been able to see them from close up. There is a controversy around their authenticity. The only way to resolve it would be to date the organic material inside the ink. German archaeologists from the University of Dresden did that in 2013, but not in a legal way, so the Egyptology community rejected the results. Still, in 2013, Pierre Talley's team found the Merer Papyrus, the logbook of a foreman at the time of Khufu, describing the process of transporting the limestone from the quarry in Tura to Giza. This very particular limestone, denser and finer than the brown limestone that is found at the center of the Great Pyramid, was used on its exterior cladding, and also on the Medium Pyramid, as well as elsewhere on the site. Objectively, even if Khufu's name is mentioned in the papyrus, just like in the red inscriptions, nothing proves that this is a tomb. Tomb or not, what is the importance of that question? If it's a tomb, it must have been constructed during the reign of Khufu, in only 20 to 25 years. And it keeps us from looking beyond the function of a tomb, not considering any of its particularities. Because as stated earlier, you don't look at a tomb and an object that has an unknown function in the same way. Historically speaking, the Great Pyramid is part of an ongoing bidding war since the Djoser Step Pyramid, where each pharaoh would outdo the size and complexity of their predecessors to demonstrate their power. Which curiously comes to a halt with Khufu, since the Pyramid of Khafre is smaller than the Great Pyramid, and Menkara's Pyramid is even smaller. If there still is an argument for Khafre's pyramid, built higher up on the plateau, making it look taller, it gets harder to argue for the small one. But that's not the only contradiction. The first Egyptian pyramid would be the Djoser Step Pyramid. Then comes the flat-sided ones, the Pyramid of Meidum, the Bent Pyramid, and the Red Pyramid. Then comes the three from the site at Giza. Then, only smaller pyramids are built with bricks, almost all collapsed. Again, we see a pattern where the older constructions are the biggest and most durable. Even though we have scientifically studied the Great Pyramid for more than 200 years, we still don't know how it was built. The image of thousands of workers wearing loincloths under the blazing sun, maneuvering thousands of blocks with ropes and wooden sledges, is deeply rooted in our minds. Même si on a l'impression que l'égyptologue croule sous la documentation, c'est vrai pour, un certain, pour certaines époques, mais pour d'autres, comme l'Ancien Empire, on est quand même un peu dans le questionnement en permanence, finalement. La construction des pyramides, on a bien des idées, mais on n'a aucun texte qui la raconte. For the megalomaniac Khufu, presented as an enthusiastic pyramid builder, all we have is a little statue seven centimeters high, almost as if he were purposely erased from history. Who can believe that such a construction site could have been organized with no writings? As far as construction sites go, Khufu is dwarfed by his father, Sneferu, who built three huge pyramids, the Meidum, the Bent Pyramid, and the Red Pyramid. For a long time, it was believed that the Pyramid of Meidum belonged to King Huni, who died before the end of its construction, and that his son Sneferu finished it before building the Bent and the Red Pyramid. But it now seems that Sneferu gets credit for all three. We don't know whether these were built simultaneously or successively, but all combined, according to archaeologists' estimations, they total close to 3.5 million tons of stone blocks. For a 25-year reign, that represents 390 blocks per day, every day. What draws our attention is the obvious question. If the pyramids are tombs, why did Sneferu need several of them? A rush to build the biggest tomb, several tombs for the same king. These hypotheses are sometimes hard to defend without a big stretch, especially given the strangeness of these buildings. Wood fragments in the Great Pyramid found by the astronomer Piazzi Smith during the previous century have been dated to 3,341 and 3,094 BCE, which pushed back by more than 500 years the dating previously accepted by Egyptology. That shows how little we know. We also wonder why three of these pyramids are slightly octagonal, 
the Red Pyramid, the Great Pyramid, and the Small Pyramid, but strangely, not the Median Pyramid. No one mentions this, except in these terms. Ce n'est pas du tout une volonté prémédité, c'est un accident tout à fait mineur d'ailleurs dû à la structure même de ces monuments. In reality this is impossible because we would notice cracks everywhere. This would also mean that the other pyramids are octagonal for the same reasons. This is not insignificant. It means they had to alter 90 centimeters at the base of the Great Pyramid, which on 115 meters both ways implies moving each block less than half a degree and repeating that on each side and the higher up you go the smaller the angle gets. As if it were not hard enough to pile up 203 layers of different heights in a single pyramid, making it even harder with the precise cardinal alignments. You should not confuse the two methods for pointing north, which can be achieved at night by aligning a string to a star, or at the equinoxes by observing shadows. With this whole building's orientation, that requires constant verifications to achieve only a tiny minimal error of 0.05 degrees for such a big building. That is nothing. To recap, approximately 4,500 years ago, people carved into the bedrock of a plateau an underground chamber 30 meters deep, on top of which was built a 230 meter side square with only a two centimeter variation, where 140 meters of blocks were piled up by using two million blocks of limestone of an average weight of 1.5 tons each in 203 layers of different heights forming an eight-sided pyramid totally centered and aligned with the four cardinal points with modern precision. This subterranean chamber is now connected to a narrow hall approximately one meter in height by one meter wide and 100 meters long, angled at precisely 26 degrees that connects to another just as narrow hall leading to a 50 meter long chamber 8.5 meters high, the most spectacular chamber in this pyramid. This chamber leads to an empty room on one side with an empty statue niche, where nothing was ever found, roughly in the middle of the room, but perfectly aligned with the central axis of the pyramid. The top of this chamber leads to an antechamber that has a security system that is totally useless, with another narrow hall leading to a chamber made of granite blocks that weigh between 12 and 70 tons on the ceiling that were transported from 900 kilometers away to build a double square shaped room that is precisely horizontal and vertical, pierced by two narrow tunnels close to 40 meters long, where the only object present is a tank where no mummy was ever found. All this to satisfy the megalomania of a king done in 20 to 25 years by 2,000 workers with the help of peasants four months a year. Based on these observations, it seems rational and safer to admit that history simply forgot how and why this pyramid was built, because nothing, absolutely nothing, proves that this pyramid is a tomb. But if the Great Pyramid is not a tomb, what is it? First, it's a geometrical object with specific proportions, pi and the golden ratio. For example, this dimension divided by this one gives us pi. The visible surface of the Great Pyramid, the four sides, divided by the invisible surface or base, gives us the golden ratio. The visible height divided by pi is equal to the total height multiplied by the squared golden ratio, etc. But for Egyptology, since Egyptians didn't know about these numbers, their mere presence is an accident. So you can imagine that bringing up the meter in this context is so surprising that it gets immediately rejected, with the justification that if you work on the numbers, you will always find whatever you want. On le retrouve notamment en Egypt sur un certain nombre de blocs qui ont été mesurés avec, le, avec des pointeurs laser comme celui-là, sur lesquels, effectivement, on retrouvait le mètre. Pourquoi le mètre se retrouve en récurrence sur certains blocs dans une région du monde et dans une autre This point brought up in the previous films might be the most problematic because everybody knows the Egyptians knew nothing about metric measurements. Are we really sure? Of course. First, because Egyptians measured in cubits. Second, because the meter was invented in 1795, thousands of years after the Great Pyramid. If the meter was not already determined by our ancestors way before our time, then this is an extraordinary coincidence. Close to 2500 BCE, using a measuring system called the Royal Cubit, supposed to be the measurement from the elbow to the tip of the fingers of a king, the Egyptians built the highest ancient stone building, 440 cubits wide at its base and 280 cubits high. As we previously mentioned, we note the presence of these two numbers that the Egyptians were not supposed to know. 
3,500 years later, in France, the cathedral, church, and castle builders used the keen as a five-unit measuring system. Five different units that are organized around the golden ratio, whose sizes may vary from one region to another. French royalty eventually imposed a single measurement, the medieval royal keen. It just happens that the royal medieval cubit, which is part of the keen, has exactly the same length as the royal cubit used for the Great Pyramid 3,500 years earlier. Let's follow this lead. Towards the end of the 17th century, the great Isaac Newton, who demonstrated the existence of gravity, sensed a link between the dimensions of the Great Pyramid and the Earth. 1781, in a book dedicated to the King of France, the mathematician Alexis Jean-Pierre Pocton also brings up a link between the dimensions of the Great Pyramid and the Earth, which has yet to be measured precisely. 1795, the meter is invented. Its value is established at one full rotation of the Earth divided by 40 million. To achieve that, the distance between Dunkirk and Barcelona was precisely measured, which gave us the value of the meter as we know it. Such a specific value that it will still take close to two more centuries to realize that by chance, the meter shines in on certain enigmatic constructions on our planet, built centuries and sometimes millenniums prior. Although they govern the mathematical relations between the dimensions of the Great Pyramid, these two numbers were supposedly unknown to their builders. Then, thousands of years later, French royalty established the use of the same cubit as used in the Great Pyramid. The coincidence doesn't stop there. The first coincidence takes place in France, where the royal span linked to the medieval cubit is precisely 20 centimeters. Five spans is precisely equal to one meter, which seems meaningless, but apparently miraculously this connects these two measuring systems and brings us to a second coincidence. The medieval cubit is 0.5235 meters, one-sixth of pi. The third coincidence occurs in Egypt. Just as the royal medieval cubit is the same length as the cubit used in the Great Pyramid, which is one-sixth of pi in meters, with the value attributed to one meter, certain dimensional ratios of the Great Pyramid give us pi and the golden ratio directly readable in meters thousands of years before the meter was defined. The fourth coincidence occurs this time in Bolivia with again the value attributed to a meter. Eight shaped blocks on the pre-Inca site of Pumapunku are exactly one meter long and one meter high with other measurements that are a whole number ratio of a meter. The fifth coincidence is in Easter Island, related to the Giza Plateau and many other enigmatic sites from the past on the Great Circle, where once again, because of the value given to a meter, the distance between Easter Island and Giza is 10,000 times the golden ratio in kilometers. 100 times pi in meters, 10 times pi in meters, 10,000 times the golden ratio in kilometers, if the size of the Earth were divided by any other number than 40 million, none of this would have ever existed. So what, some people may still ask. To determine the meter, you have to have measured Earth. Who was capable of doing that so long ago? Put all these coincidences together and you get the most enigmatic tomb ever built on the planet. If some people stick to the hypotheses of workers armed with wooden tools, ropes, and miraculous coincidences, we have chosen to not believe anything. Convinced that science will recognize science, we decided to use the latest technology to verify our intuition. Especially when far, very far from Egypt, the choice of the meter produces a sixth coincidence. This time in India, in the cave of Sudama, on the site of Barabar. Its dome is six meters in diameter, with a segment of a sphere three meters in radius, with its center at one meter above ground. All this because in 1795, we decided to invent the meter and gave it a specific value that thousands of years later shine a new light on ancient masterpieces of engineering, for which we have no documentation and no memory. Since the royal cubit was transmitted, why not the meter? Maybe miracles do exist, but when they come together in rocks that are so hard, with such precision, it isn't magic anymore. It is science. In the previous film, we presented the results of the 3D scans that revealed high-precision symmetry, but at that point, we hadn't yet measured this precision. In late February 2020, we filmed the complete debriefing of the analysis of the scans by an engineer from the AGP company, and then went back to Barabar in March to verify what we had missed. Here again, everything started with an intuition when we first visited these caves. 
Enfin, on, ça n'a pas été fait au laser. Ça, c'est fait à la main. Et il faut des milliers et des milliers d'heures pour obtenir un, un travail comme celui-là. Having noticed a huge gap between what has been published on these caves and our own observations, we decided to go back and scan them in 3D. Ouais, un glacé superbe hein, qui est obtenu par un, un ponçage de, de la surface, qui est très difficile à obtenir avec un ponçage avec une, euh, classique avec une roche euh, et de l'eau, mais qu'on peut obtenir plus facilement avec une, euh, un sable fin abrasif, très très fin. On a, une, on a une brillance équivalente à ce que l'on obtient aujourd'hui avec les techniques modernes. It's the same as in Pumapunku, with no measurements, without a trained eye used to precision, and knowledgeable about how granite is carved, you could totally miss what we found. To verify an intuition is quite expensive, especially when speaking of 3D scans far from home, but it was worth it. The results were far beyond our expectations. On est tombé sur euh, pratiquement des, des grains de quartz qui sont les plus durs dans ce granit amica et quartz et on avait une résolution de surface qui était l'équivalent de celle du verre. Donc on s'est dit, là, il y a encore une autre, euh, un autre problème qu'il va falloir essayer de résoudre. Comment les gens s'y sont-ils pris pour réaliser une prouesse pareille dans un endroit clos, fermé, il y a juste une porte, il n'y a pas de fenêtre, il n'y a rien d'autre, dans le noir total, quasiment, où il y a une simple réverbération de la lumière, comment ont-ils fait pour amener déjà une surface, quand on la touche, qui ressemble à celle du verre, et avec une précision de, de, de polissage qui est omniprésente, sol, plafond et ailleurs, de, qui est équivalente au lustre du verre. Here is the 3D scan of the Gopika cave on the Nagarjuni site in India. This was not created by software. It's the actual cave recomposed by millions of points projected by using rotating lasers to scan the walls. As we showed in the previous film, the lateral walls of this cave are not vertical, but very slightly inclined at less than three degrees. Thanks to this study, we now know that the angle of inclination changes by three tenths of a degree along a span of 8.1 meters. What we had missed before is that they are slightly curved en fait, on peut décomposer la grotte en quatre arcs de cercle. Euh, deux petits cercles sur les extrémités et deux grands cercles euh, sur les deux grands côtés. Des cercles qui ont un rayon de euh, 100, 120 mètres. The curving is 7.5 cm deep. This cave is actually only composed of curves. That fact was not recorded in any archaeological documents. We were not capable of seeing that with the naked eye. And that's why we came back to verify it in March 2020. To measure the level of symmetry announced at the end of the last film, the AGB company cut this scan lengthwise and then superimposed the right segment on the left and vice versa. The result is astounding. 62% of the 44 million points that comprise this scan are almost at the same place. A remarkable feature. Ce qui fait que euh, on se dit mais les, les courbures ne sont plus tout à fait aléatoires. Euh, c'est pas une erreur de travail, c'est quelque chose qui a été prédéterminé. Let's not beat around the bush. To cut such a large and complex volume into granite with such precise symmetry seems impossible. This degree of precision was part of the technical specifications decided upon before even starting the work. Are symmetrically polished mirror-like walls necessary to shelter from monsoons? The idea is problematic. We find the same degree of precision in every one of these caves. We'll go into this in more detail in the next film. We needed a 3D scan to discover what we couldn't see with our simple measurements and naked eyes. That makes us wonder, what did the builders use to obtain and verify this degree of precision? We find the same precision all over the planet, where normally we shouldn't. So how do we wrap this up? Decorative element, tomb, monsoon shelter, That's what history tells us today. On s'aperçoit que l'histoire elle est écrite par les gens qui gagnent les guerres et pas toujours correcte, elle est simplement écrite et puis il faut après peut-être faire le ménage. History has marked our minds with the idea that touching it is sacrilegious and can cause extreme reactions from certain historians. But if you needed to build a pyramid or a massive wall, would you call a technician or a historian? 
For us, it all started with an intuition that our present civilization is not the first time out for 300,000 year old Homo sapiens. The intuition that all the common factors of these archaeological sites could be explained by something other than mere coincidence, a false assumption that keeps us from questioning anything. Why not consider this explanation a transmission of knowledge to our ancestors who were still hunter-gatherers by the survivors of an ancient civilization who could have been perceived as gods? Wouldn't an evolved science be perceived as magic in the eyes of those who know nothing about it? How does an actual hunter-gatherer react when he sees what modern technology allows us to achieve? The same intuition that our history is wrong in assuming that civilization is only 10,000 years old. This implies viewing history through the prism of war, as if humanity were essentially evil and war inevitable. I believe the evidence supports the view that we have lost a whole civilization from our historical record. We are a species with amnesia. But where do we go from there? In today's Western, modern, complicated reality, some people wonder what positive value could all this bring to our lives, other than satisfying curiosity by filling in the blanks of our history. The answer is that our history interrogates our future and the world we're going to leave for our children. We are a constantly innovating society that thinks that everything was always less advanced in the past. After all our research, we find ourselves imagining a past far more developed than previously thought, reduced to the tales of centuries and millennia past by a humanity that has become amnesic. Our elders have a lot to teach us. They were capable of building monumental features that have survived through the ages as a badge of honor for our species. Yes, humanity was once capable of all that for the beauty of it, but maybe even more. We are now going to carefully follow other leads, like the production of energy. To achieve these sites, energy was needed, and in large quantities, way beyond that provided by human or animal muscular strength. The lead on conducting research using sound frequencies also seems promising. We are currently working on all the data compiled at Barabar. We still have to precisely quantify what we have just mentioned briefly. Thanks to our collaborative research team that constantly broadens its technical skills, our work goes on. We will be back soon to share all this with you for a better comprehension of the achievements of these ancient forgotten builders.